here. And if I could just remind everybody to put yourselves on mute. Great. Well, um, this is the Juno Gastineau Rotary Club, and we are here on January 28th, 2021. And we're pleased to welcome Fran Ulmer, who most of us know from her many roles in the state, and she's currently working on the Arctic. And so we're going to hear about uh, what's, uh, what's coming up in the Arctic from Fran Ulmer. So Fran, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, I'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you very much. Let me see if I can get to my screen. Can you see it? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. I, I always uh, take a big deep breath before sharing my screen because you know nine times out of 10 it works, but not always. So uh, let's, let's try uh, getting it full screen. Is that better? Yes, okay, terrific. So um, let me just start by saying I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about the Arctic. It's a place that has been attracting a lot of international attention for a lot of different reasons. And yet uh, for Alaskans, we kind of take it for granted, don't we? Uh, so I, I think it's kind of fun to talk to fellow Alaskans about this topic. Usually I'm talking to people elsewhere. And um, I know you will know a lot of what I'm going to say this morning. So my apologies for, for doing that. But I never want to assume that people know everything that everybody else knows, because I know it's not true for me. So I'm going to cover about a three hour lecture in about 20 minutes. And what I'm going to do is address these questions. What's changing? who's impacted and why should we care about it? But before I launch into that, I wanna take you on a short trip to the North Pole with me. I think we're all a little travel deprived. So I just thought I would start with a, a trip. So this is a Russian nuclear icebreaker. It's called the 50 years of victory. And back in 2017, I had the opportunity to ride it to the North Pole. Uh, it, I was actually a lecturer on board the ship and we left from Murmansk, which is the big port in Northern Russia, where not only their, most of their icebreakers are, are home ported, but also a lot of their military ships as well. And we, uh, we left from there and took off and saw lots of ice, lots of water, Lots of gray skies, a few blue skies. That little tiny thing you see next to the water is a polar bear. We did get a little closer to polar bears than that shot is, uh, but not, not too many. What was hugely surprising was the day we got to the North Pole, which took us about a week from Romance to get up to the North Pole, it rained. Now, that was a bit of a shock for many of us. Uh, that didn't mean that we didn't take pictures. As you can see, the Chinese tourists on board were, were busy um, taking pictures, marking the moment. Uh, and there were quite a few uh, international travelers on board this ship. But the next day, actually that day, we were supposed to get off the ship and walk around on the ice, but the captain thought that the ice was too thin. So the idea that there we were in late July, which is not supposed to be the thinnest ice month that comes in August or September. And he felt that the ice was a little too thin for us to walk on it, meant that we found a better place the next day uh, and actually got off the ship and had the opportunity to walk around on it. So let me say that the reason I shared this with you is to illustrate a couple of points. Uh, first of all, that the Russians are interested in not only using their big icebreakers to bring ships through the North, Northern Sea Route, but also taking tourists, at least for a couple weeks out of every summer. The international interest, as evidenced by the many people who take these tri trips that aren't from the United States, and the fact that the ice was that thin and raining at the North Pole, which even shocked the Russian nuclear icebreaker captain, is an illustration of some of the points I'm gonna make. So what is changing in the Arctic? And again, 
most of you know these things because you follow the news and you stay abreast, but the Arctic is warming more than twice as fast as global temperatures. And we're seeing a tremendous retreat of glaciers and less sea ice. And this means, of course, that all of the ecosystems are changing because the animals and the plants and the birds and the fish are all developed and evolved to accommodate the kind of cold and snow and ice that they've had for a few hundred years, if not a few thousand. And so we're seeing, yes, big changes in our seasons, in when we get snow, when we get rain. And we are seeing, as a result of that, changes in the chemistry of the ocean as well as sea level rise. So um, there's lots of graphs I could show you, but the consistent pattern of warming, not just in the Arctic, but globally is pretty pronounced. Uh, this past year was the second warmest year ever on record and about nine of the top 10 warmest years ever recorded in human history were in the last, yes, the last 10 years, which is not terribly surprising because we know through geologic time, every time carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere, so does temperature. And when it goes down, so does temperature. So we're now at about 400 parts per million. So we are even off of this chart. And sea ice is in pretty rapid decline. Again, it's not terribly surprising when the atmosphere warms and when the ocean warms, uh, it's not too surprising to see sea ice retreating. It forms later in the fall and goes out earlier in the spring. And even in the old ice, the old ice pack that you expect to find north of Canada and north of Russia, it is decreasing. I show you this slide just to illustrate how radically different that is over a very long period of time. We're kind of off the charts. I don't know if you can see that. I, I, I actually am seeing faces over the last part of that chart, but I hope you can see it. Here's Mendenhall Glacier. I don't know how many of you were in Juneau in the 70s, but I'll tell you it's a shock to me when I come back to Juneau and see how much the Mendenhall Glacier has changed in a relatively short period of time. Um, and that's happening literally all over the Arctic. And then there's the Greenland ice sheet, which again is losing a phenomenal amount of ice. That particularly matters because ice that is on land, like the Greenland ice sheet, when it melts, it contributes to sea level rise. Unlike, unlike sea ice, of course, when that melts, it doesn't contribute to sea level rise. But places like the Greenland ice sheet, yes, they're having a big impact. And we are seeing permafrost thawing. Permafrost, as you may know, underlies about a quarter of all land in the Northern Hemisphere. Actually, the first time I saw that statistic, it, it really did surprise me because of course we don't have permafrost in Juneau. Um, and so we don't really think about it if we're Southeasterners, but the further North you go, whether you're in Canada or Alaska or in Russia, the more you see. And the fact that it is thawing, and as a result of that creating unstable foundations and coastal erosion is a pretty big deal. So let's talk a little bit about how these changes impact Alaskans and how these changes impact the rest of the world. And again, this is pretty brief because I know you know most of these things, but in Alaska particularly, but also in Russia and in Canada, these changes actually have a big impact, particularly for indigenous people, indigenous people for whom the lands and waters provide a substantial amount of food. So uh, food security really matters, but it's not only that, it's, it's health and language and culture and safety. Uh, we, we've seen big impacts in how the warming, the less sea ice, and the thawing permafrost and contribute to both coastal erosion and river erosion, and, and that impacts villages. Uh, we are seeing that in a pretty dramatic way in Alaska. When the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about, oh golly, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, came out with a study that said almost three dozen villages in Alaska are going to have to move 
because of how they are being impacted by climate change. Um, and of course, some of the communities like Kivalina and Shishmaref and Newtok are all in the process of doing that. Uh, Newtok is moving more rapidly than most, but there is more of that ahead. It's not just villages, though. I mean, it's, it's also the pipeline that, you know, the LES pipeline has had to modify the technology to keep the pipeline safe. Uh, the road uh, that runs alongside the pipeline, we used to call it the Hall Road. Um, they have experienced considerable problems. And I don't know if you saw the news two days ago, Cherfornik, a house actually went down in a sinkhole. So um, this is uh, a big problem and it will continue to be a problem as permafrost thaws. There are a lot of changes that we're not really sure how the changes will impact Alaskans and other people in the North. A good example of this is ocean acidification and how it will impact areas of Alaska in terms of both sport and commercial fishing. Um, you see the red areas, this is a University of Alaska Fairbanks study that was done a few years ago that tried to estimate the parts of Alaska that might be most impacted by ocean acidification. What is ocean acidification? Again, you, you know this, but just a quick refresher. If you look at all of the extra carbon dioxide that humanity has put into the atmosphere since we started burning fossil fuels, about a quarter of it goes into plants, about a quarter of the extra goes into the ocean and the other 50% goes into the atmosphere. So kind of good news, bad news here. If the ocean had not been absorbing some of that extra carbon dioxide, our atmosphere would be even warmer. So in that sense, it's doing something helpful. But on the other hand, absorbing more carbon dioxide means that the chemistry of the ocean is changing, becoming more acidic, and that interferes with shell formation, which of course creates a whole lot of question marks about the survival of a number of species that rely on a stable chemistry. So that's just briefly, I mean, there are many other things too, in terms of increased fire and increased changes in where plants and shrubs and trees are moving. I mean, there's a lot more I could say, but let's transition to what difference do these changes mean to people beyond the Arctic. Um, it, there are a number of things, but I'll concentrate on these four. Uh, a warmer Arctic means more warming globally. It means more sea level rise. It means changing weather, and it means easier access to a place that hasn't been that accessible in the past. So more warming. Um, the white of ice and snow reflects solar radiation. So the more white there is, at the Arctic, both in terms of sea ice and snow, the more radiation gets sent back up into the atmosphere. The more blue water and dark green area because of retreating snow and retreating snow, sea ice, the more gets absorbed. So the more ice goes away and snow goes away, the more heat is absorbed by the earth system, which contributes to more warming of the ocean, which contributes to more sea ice. You get the picture here. It's a cycle that just keeps getting worse and worse. And so the fact that we're losing ice has big implications for the overall global temperature. Think of the Arctic as the air conditioner for the planet. And the air conditioner for the planet is losing energy because we're losing that white reflectivity that sends radiation back into the atmosphere. That's why a big change in the Arctic changes global temperatures. I mentioned before that Greenland and glaciers that are like, you know, coastal glaciers are contributing more water to the sea and to the oceans, which means sea level rise is rising. It's not only rising, the rate of the rise is increasing, which is why it really has a lot of um, attention, so to speak, for coastal areas. You know, most scientists are reluctant to say exactly how much sea level rise there will be by the end of the 21st century, but kind of a middle of the road guess is about a meter or three feet. 
by the end of the century. So that's what Miami Beach looks like with one meter of sea level rise. So it's a, it's a fairly big deal. If you think about all the coastal cities around the world, um, that's a big impact. But it's not just someday out in the future, it's actually happening right now. And so this, the Norfolk Virginia Naval Station, um, gets what they call sunny day flooding. Actually, they call it that in Miami too. When there's a big tide, they are getting more and more flooded streets, more and more flooded facilities because the overall sea level rise has gone up. So tidal changes are bringing significant impacts to places, whether it's now in places like Norfolk, Virginia and Miami Beach that has, by the way, built higher sidewalks so that people don't get their feet wet. Again, we're not seeing that so much up here. Um, it depends upon where you are and the local conditions. Every place will get a different impact by this, but it's still a pretty big deal. So I'm, the third thing that I mentioned was that Arctic warming impacts global weather. So just very briefly, the jet stream used to look more like a donut. Now it looks more like a snake. So we're getting this wavy jet stream effect, which is what you hear sometimes when the weather forecaster talks about, um, you know, the polar vortex. What does that actually mean? It means that because that jet stream is less stable, that, that is keeping colder temperatures north and warmer temperatures in the mid latitude, you're getting these variations of extreme warmth in the north and extreme cold in the south and longer periods of rain or longer periods of drought, longer, diff very different weather. Sometimes it's called global weirding. Well, the atmospheric scientists that are studying this don't have a clear answer as to exactly how this is unfolding because it's still pretty recent, but one theory about this is because there's less of a temperature differential between the north and the mid latitudes, it has weakened the jet stream. And so you get this varying wavery kind of jet stream, which is creating these very different weather patterns than what we consistently thought were normal. Again, it, you know, 10 years from now, the atmospheric scientists uh, who are studying this will have a more of a consensus, but the point is, it is clear that a warming Arctic is contributing to this phenomenon. So uh, we're not going back to stable climate uh, anytime soon. The final thing that I wanna mention in terms of how these changes are impacting the rest of the world, and frankly, why there's so much more international interest in the Arctic than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's because it's like all of a sudden there's a new ocean. You know, for a long, long time, the Arctic was considered just a place far away, out of sight, dangerous, dark, cold, impenetrable. And now it's like, well, it's, it's a new ocean. Um, you can go there. You can go there whether you're shipping LNG or you can go there on a tourist experience to the North Pole. Um, that has raised a lot of questions about economic development, about resources, about using the space as a shipment point. Matter of fact, most of what you hear at international conferences is about this point. That is a new shipping route, either the Northern Sea Route, which is above Russia, or the Northwest Passage, which is above Canada. I might note that either of those, of course, go through the Bering Strait, uh, that narrow body of water between Alaska and Russia. So it's of interest to us because of the potential for ship traffic and perhaps unintended experiences like oil spills or, or ship disasters. So that's why a lot of Alaskans, particularly Alaskans living in that region, are concerned about how this may unfold. Uh, why is the world interested? Because it's a shorter route. It's shorter than the Suez, it's shorter than the Panama, 
but that doesn't mean that it's going to happen anytime soon. Because let's remember, the Arctic still is cold in the winter. It's still dark in the winter. There's still ice. It's not like it's ice for year round. But having said that, there is more interest in shipping, a particularly the northern sea route, not so much the Northwest Passage. Why? In part because Russia is promoting it. Russia sees it as an important way of getting their LNG off of their Russian Arctic coast. And yes, this is the same icebreaker that I rode to the North Pole, that is the 50 years of victory, doing what it usually does, which as a transport of these commercial vessels, making sure that they can get through the ice safely. And we are seeing an increase. It's still not a lot in terms of total tonnage, but it's the trend, it's the trend. So let's talk about the resources. I'm not gonna cover mining this morning, but oil and gas. Um, a little over 10 years ago, the USGS came out with this study that estimated how much oil and gas potential is there in the Arctic region. And of course, this is not a for sure thing. This is an estimate, right? But it does show a fair amount of oil potential. Uh, and it is unclear exactly at what price this makes sense. At the time, oil prices were really high. So when this study came out, there was a lot of news coverage of this. As prices have gone down and fracking and other sources have come online, this has become much less of interest, except in Russia. Russia is bullish on Arctic oil and gas development because that's where most of their oil and gas is. And it is a very lucrative opportunity for their economy, not just in terms of providing oil and gas to themselves, but in terms of shipping their LNG to China, Japan, Singapore, and Europe, which they are doing. The Yamal Peninsula in Northern Russia is a, it's in a frenzy of LNG development, construction, and shipping. And that creates a fair amount of income for Russia. So they're going to continue to develop as much as they possibly can. It's probably not terribly surprising that Russia is also very concerned about the protection of their northern coasts. I mean, if you think about it, Russian territory is almost half of the Arctic in terms of bordering the Arctic Ocean. So when they talked about more infrastructure, both military and civilian, it really wasn't that much of a surprise, except when you start looking at what kind of infrastructure they've been building. And a lot of it is in the space of um, defense. And again, whoops, that isn't necessarily a problem, except if you combine the development of the northern region, the investment in military assets, and the fact that in the last few years, Russia, both in terms of its, its air power and its water power, um, have been demonstrating their strength. And we've seen stories here in Alaska about some of the uh, flights that have been taken in our airspace and concerns about that. So why, why is there concern about that? Well, you know, it's, it's basically concern about Russia in general, whether it's in the Arctic or other places, uh, it, it's not exactly been a predictably good partner in pursuing international cooperation. And so there's been anxiety, particularly in Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Um, matter of fact, Sweden reinstituted mandatory conscription and, and Norway has really built up their ability to um, protect themselves. The other big question mark in the Arctic in terms of what happens in the future is China. China in recent years has expressed more and more interest in the Arctic. Uh, they have adopted a policy, they have their second um, icebreaker, they do research, they've talked about the Polar Silk Road, 
adding it to their investment portfolio for infrastructure. And of course, they've attempted to enter into contracts with uh, com other countries in Canada and Greenland and other places, particularly for the opportunity for mineral development. And again, not terribly surprising, like most places, uh, they're looking for the long-term well-being of their people and their economy. But it has raised a lot of questions. What does this actually mean? Is there a triangular struggle over the future of the Arctic between the US, China, and Russia? Um, this has led to a little bit of tension in, in the Arctic showing up occasionally and in pronouncements made by State Department officials and occasionally in in editorials. I would say it, in my opinion, it is um, slightly overblown. There's been more cooperation than competition. But having said that, uh, it has left everyone with question marks. Um, Alaska too. We've seen a buildup in military in the Arctic capacity. Obviously the US government is concerned about maintaining its own national security we know that the Arctic is a strategic location. We know that Alaska is a strategic location, particularly in terms of air power. So it's not surprising that the US government has been investing more in our um, Air Force in Alaska, but there's now money to construct another icebreaker and there is concern about what else we should be doing by way of infrastructure. Um, there, there are lots of quotes like this that talk about how important it is that the U.S. up its game in the Arctic, both in terms of infrastructure readiness, but also in terms of looking out for the future of the region. Matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago, the Navy came out with its new Arctic strategy called a Blue Arctic. And uh, this week, uh, the Secretary uh, Actually, I'm not sure who said it for the Army, but the Army said a new Army Arctic plan is about to come out as well. Uh, we do have a strategy as the United States government. Uh, this was adopted way back in 2013 that kind of lays out the US goal for the Arctic region. That hasn't changed. Security, stewardship, and international cooperation. That remains what we say is front and center our responsibilities. But how that rolls out obviously differs dramatically from one administration to another. So I'm getting to the end here. I just want to say um, I've been talking about some of the stresses, Russia, China, US, military buildup, economic competition. But I would say um, overall, the Arctic remains a peaceful place, fortunately. In, co you know, in comparison to a lot of other regions of the world, Arctic cooperation, international cooperation has been very good. And I'm not gonna go through all of these examples, but there are a few examples that I, I will highlight as to why I say that cooperation in the Arctic is, is more important and more prevalent than competition. The Arctic Council has been around for 25 years. All Arctic eight countries, plus observing nations, non-Arctic countries, organizations, indigenous people, the permanent participants, work together on two goals, environmental protection and sustainable development. Those have been the goals from the beginning and they still are. And at the meetings of the council and at the meetings of the working groups that are under the council, you see a lot of cooperation producing reports and recommendations, all consensus based. Here are three agreements that the council helped make happen on search and rescue, on oil spill preparedness and on scientific research. And most recently, a fabulous new agreement that frankly nobody thought would actually happen, the Central Arctic Ocean beyond national boundaries, that's what the Central Arctic Ocean means in this case, there will be no commercial fishing for 16 years. And not only did the Arctic nations agree to that, but so did China and South Korea and Japan and the EU, major fishing nations of the world. Why did they do this? 
because we don't know enough about the ecosystem, the fishery resource, the health of this region to possibly be able to sustainably manage a fishery. And everybody agreed that if anybody went there, everybody would want to go there and potentially have a disaster. So this is an example of one of the rare precautionary treaties that said, you know, we're not going to mess it up before we even know what's there. Um, so another example of why I say this is a region of cooperation. So in, in conclusion, the Arctic is changing. It's a very, very valuable, but also vulnerable place. Yes, there are many, many countries interested in this region. And yes, there's some competition for resources and potential development. But overall, it's still a region of cooperation. For the people who live there, there's a lot of adaptation that's going to have to happen because the Arctic of the 21st century doesn't look anything like the Arctic of the 20th century. And we know change is increasing, not decreasing. And there are a lot of global and geopolitical implications of this. If you are interested in more information about the Arctic, here are a couple of ideas. The US Arctic Research Commission, I chaired it for nine years. I no longer do, but lots of reports there and interesting information at arctic.gov. Um, I might note that NOAA always, every single year does a report card on how the Arctic is doing and how it's changing. You can go to arctic.noaa.gov and see that. Um, and there are many other places as well. So with that, back to you. I might note I'm currently at Harvard as a senior fellow, even though I'm sitting here in Anchorage right now, everything's virtual. But I am happy to either answer some questions now or if you want to send me questions later, um, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, President Doug, back to you. Thank you, Fran. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's always, uh, it, well, it's very interesting to hear what's happening um, in the Arctic and around our, and around our uh, Arctic area. Fran, do you know how many uh, icebreakers uh, Russia, I, I heard you said that China has four or they're building four. And I think the United States only has four, uh, but I've, I've heard there's a ton of icebreakers out of uh, Russia. So Doug, it's actually worse than that. Um, the US had two, but one of them is broken down in Seattle. So right now we have one functioning icebreaker. China has two functioning icebreakers, relatively new, as opposed to our one that remains, which is decades old. And the last count I saw was that Russia has 42. And they have the most powerful icebreakers. They're nuclear. Uh, the Russian nuclear icebreaker I went on in 2017 at the time was the largest and most powerful, but since then they've built two that are larger and more powerful. Um, so yes, but let's remember, Russia does have a heck of a lot more Arctic coastline than we do. Um, so on that level, it's not terribly surprising. And I would say that the US for one reason or another, um, everybody has a theory about this, has been reluctant to invest in the Arctic in general because we don't actually think of ourselves as an Arctic nation. Russia, Canada, Greenland, Norway, Iceland, they think of themselves as an Arctic nation. If you go down to Iowa or Kansas and say, you know, is the US an Arctic nation? You'd probably get a lot of question marks. So when our congressional delegation tries to convince members of Congress to fund icebreakers or anything else in the Arctic, it's a tough slog. Unfortunately, um, that's been a problem which has made it much harder to get the necessary funding to even replace the two icebreakers that are ancient and now the one icebreaker that's functional. Um, but at least one is funded and the Coast Guard has plans for four and if Congress decides to spend money on it, uh, perhaps we will have a little more capacity as we need, because not only do we need an icebreaker in the North, we need an icebreaker in the South to replenish the people and supplies at our Antarctic science bases. Um, so anyway, a long answer to your question, Doug, sorry. 
Thank you. Who else has a question? Uh, Corey. So I'm curious how the the Russians view all this. I mean, from your time with them, because I've heard, you know, not just that they've got opportunities for increased shipping and all that, but it's going to make all of their farmland more, um, you know, uh, profitable and productive. So I've heard that Russia actually views global warming as a great thing as opposed to something that needs to be fought and stopped. Yes, well, you hear different things at different venues where Russians show up to give speeches, but generally your statement is true. More, more often than not, the Russian speaker will talk about this as an opportunity zone because not only is it increased shipping and turning the Northern Sea Route into the next Suez Canal is very much of interest to them, but also because that's where their oil and gas is. So getting that to market also is very, very important to them, which they see as potentially being enhanced. I think that the, um, the point that is sometimes made about agriculture or their land being more productive is a huge uncertainty. Remember how much permafrost Russia has. Permafrost is already creating serious problems for them in terms of their infrastructure. Their villages are having just as much trouble as our coastal villages and their oil and gas infrastructure, including the new infrastructure they're building at Yamal, is threatened by permafrost as much as potentially our own Alyeska pipeline is, unless we are constantly advancing technology to deal with the changing condition. Remember, permafrost is, you know, when it's frozen, it's like building something on concrete. When it's thawing, it's like building something on mud. So, um, there, the ups and downs, the winners and losers, so to speak, even for the Russians, is uncertain, but they are not as um, anxious about it as many others are, perhaps in part because they see their economic opportunities in the North as being incredibly promising, and maybe they will be. Another question. Mm -hmm. Doug, Liz Balstead had some questions in the chat. Do you want to speak to those, Liz? That was actually me. Um, I was just wondering, so you've talked about many of the concerns and conflicting interests of the Arctic. How can or how should we balance the needs of locals with national interests? And then as kind of a follow-up question, there's also a lot of questions about what's going to happen ecologically in the, the Arctic. You hinted at that with the um, Arctic Ocean and the fishing. Could you talk a little bit about what we can do in the face of so much uncertainty to protect ecological and in, uh, indigenous interests while also developing national interests? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, so let me start by saying resilience and the ability of humans who live in the region to be able to adapt as quickly as conditions are making them adapt is a huge challenge. And for particularly small villages that are at risk, the time schedule is really challenging. Um, and we're seeing that in descriptions of how communities right now in Alaska are having to cope with situations that they can't really predict. So providing to those regions both and those villages and the people, particularly the indigenous people, not only a voice in the, the big decisions about you know, what happens at the national level, but equipping them with the kind of resources necessary to plan and adapt is a responsibility, I think, of both the state of Alaska and the federal government. And we saw just this past week when President Biden reissued an executive order that had been issued back under the Obama administration called the Northern Bering Sea Resilience Area that was specifically focusing on the Bering Strait region and empowering tribal organizations in that region to have a seat at the table in terms of managing responsibly whatever development takes place there 
and managing the resilience efforts in terms of protecting their villages. So um, just this within the last week, you have seen an, a recognition by our federal government that indigenous people in the region must have a, not just a seat at the table, but a big voice in how that region is managed and what kinds of steps are taken locally to protect them from the most potentially damaging impacts, whether it's from shipping or oil and gas or anything else. That's a slightly different question than the national security interests and how that plays into the decisions that the federal government might make about infrastructure, whether that's telecommunications or more Air Force capacity or more icebreakers. Um, that's kind of a different level than the regional impact level. And right now, other than through um, the same kind of public input that you and I might be able to give the federal government, uh, it's pretty hard to have much of a voice in how the Navy strategic plan or the Army strategic plan or the Air Force strategic plan for the Arctic will roll out. But given the fact that there is a growing awareness that it's not just national interests, but it's local, regional, and tribal interests that must be listened to, I am hopeful that over the next few years, there will be a more meaningful role for engagement, even at that big security level. Rosemary, is that a hand? That's a hand, yes. Good morning, Fran. Um, Good morning. Just looking at the map, um, has your uh, organization or the different groups that you've been involved with, I mean, just looking at that map, the Bering Strait has a potential to be a, um, a contentious area, perhaps if uh, all of this peaceful and cooperative um, work were to turn into sort of a military aggression. Um, we've got a real hot spot there sitting up on our coast, don't we? As far as a, a strategic military, um, you know, that Bering Strait looks to me a lot like the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal that you mentioned, as far as... Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Rosemary, Entry. you're right. In, you're absolutely right. You know, it's only like 50 miles across, right? Exactly, so, yeah. You know, it, it's a choke point. It's an incredibly important piece of water. Uh, it is one of the largest marine mammal migration routes in the world. So think about the bowhead whales. And I mean, the, yeah. it is a place that ecologically, environmentally, biologically is incredibly important for fish, birds, marine mammals. And because of that, it's also very important to the indigenous people of the region because it's a hot spot for subsistence hunting, fishing, and gathering as well, right? So you've got, yeah. small, you've got small boats out there. And now you've got ice-strengthened LNG tankers from the Yamal Peninsula going through there down to China and Japan and Singapore delivering LNG. So yes, even already it is, it is a place that, um, let's just say, it's attracting a lot of attention for a lot of important re reasons, ecologically and conservation-wise, um, culturally and food security-wise, uh, shipping, commercial-wise, and potentially military-wise. So the good news is there's actually been, so far, a fair amount of good cooperation on a bilateral level between Russia and the United States on routes, shipping routes. So there have been, there's been an agreement uh, blessed by the Coast Guard in terms of shipping routes for the commercial vessels versus where the subsistence vessels are. And there's been an effort to get technology, small, it's a step above handheld radios, but for subsistence <coughs> hunters and fishers to be able to communicate where they are or at least see where the ships are. So even if the fog rolls in, it reduces the safety issues, or at least hopefully concerns about that. And the Coast Guards between Russia and the US, the, the Red Guard and the Coast Guard, and, and actually the 
there's a Northern Arctic Coast Guard Forum with all of the coastal states of the Arctic that have a communication link. So again, theoretically steps so far indicate cooperation and the ability to respond together in case of a disaster. But the potential remains to be seen in terms of what could happen. And it is a reason why the Navy is taking more interest in the Arctic than it did 15 or 20 years ago. Now, having said that, the Navy has always been present in the Arctic, at least since you know World War II, in submarines. We've, we have had and still have submarine presence by the US Navy in the Arctic, but the surface presence has been very limited. And there's an interest now in both the Navy and the Coast Guard, plus the Air Force and everybody else, having more of a visible pre presence uh, in anticipation of what you mentioned, Rosemary, which is what happens next and what happens if Russia decides to be more aggressive as opposed to more cooperative. Uh, this is another reason why it's such an interesting area because we don't know the answer to a lot of these questions. Well, the other the other thing though that I keep thinking about um, as you were talking is um, the movement that we see on the part of China um, to be more aggressive on the international front. And, um, you know, if China has, is that interested in this area as well um, and consider themselves to be a quote unquote Arctic country, um, we could have some really potentially significant problems there. Well, that is the issue that was raised by Secretary Pompeo in Finland a year and a half ago. Um, you know, the fact that China calls itself a near Arctic state is what attracted mm -hmm. so much attention. But honestly, I personally, this is what I think. Um, you know, China's interested in natural resources. They're not interested in trying to maintain a physical presence there as much as they are interested in partnerships, whether it's with um, a potential gas line in Alaska, whether it's in a mining claim in Greenland, whether it's in, you know, they're mm -hmm. interested in oil, gas, minerals, because they're a very big country with a lot of people and not a whole lot of natural resources of their own. I mean, in some areas they do, like, you know, some key minerals. But um, th this notion that there's really concern about countries that aren't Arctic nations being interested in the Arctic. You know, it's funny, just this past week, India had a big announcement about how much more they are going to be investing in Arctic research. Wow. Germany has been in, Germany has been investing in Arctic research for years. They, you know, the Alfred Wegener Institute has superb Arctic researchers and scientists and do ice breaking trips all the time. Um, Japan announced this week that they have a new board game out on changes in the Arctic because they want kids to learn about the Arctic through playing this board game in hopes that they become interested in becoming Arctic researchers and scientists. So, I mean, this is not just uh, a China yeah. thing. This is an international thing and it's understandable because it's a really interesting region. All right. Thanks. Well, Fran, I'm going to jump in here. It's uh, eight o'clock. Fran, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm always impressed on, on uh, um, how uh, acceptable or not acceptable, uh, accessible um, our, our people in Alaska are and, and, and how much they uh, ask questions and uh, answer questions. And uh, so I really thank you for coming on uh, today to our Rotary Club.